Well, church, it is great to be back with you. I'm Daniel, by the way. Uh, thank you. Four of you are real stoked to have me back. Uh, no. Uh, Hey, listen, let me just start by saying uh, I have not been in the pulpit for five weeks, uh, and what a gift that has been to me and my family. Uh, It it made my heart so happy to be able to stay at home with the girls and and just kind of relax and know that everything up here was going amazingly. Uh, You heard amazing messages. I thought Luann just brung it, if that's a word, brung it for a couple of weeks. Mark Sorensen, Mark Swayze, Pier Streak, you, you were in great hands with Matt and the band and Connie running volunteers. It was amazing. So I say that just to say thank you uh, on behalf of me and my family that we were able to step away. I know it's a gift that a lot of people don't get and that's not missed on me. Uh, and just to say too that we're so blessed as a church to have so many amazing people making this happen each and every week. So I have been out of the pulpit for five weeks which means I got a lot to say, all right? So I've been, I, I've been keeping it all in and now we've got a time together uh, and so I've got a lot to say. So I've got to admit in preparing for this weekend's message, uh, I wrote two sermons, okay? I, I wrote a short sermon and I wrote a long sermon. Which one do you want to hear? Middle. Middle. <laughs> That's kind of like both, right? How about I give you both? Does that sound good? First, let's, let's start with the short sermon. Here's uh, all you need. And I, I preached this last night and somebody said that uh, it sounds like this sermon should be coming from you in a suit with a big smile in the compact center. So do with that what you will. Here's a short one. Stop being a sluggard. Stop being lazy. Stop slacking. Do something with your life. Quit procrastinating. Quit making excuses. Quit letting life pass you by. Make a difference, write the book, start the business, start a Bible reading plan, ask the girl on a date, go to the gym, go back to school, chase your dreams. God has you here for a purpose, so do something about it. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, right? (laughs) You're You're not getting off that easy. Don't try to clap me off this stage, okay? That's a short one. Here's the longer one. Today, we are wrapping up this series called Wisdom, looking at the wisdom of the Proverbs by talking about sloth. So if you've got your Bibles, uh, you may know that sloth just means being laziness. If you've got your Bibles, Proverbs chapter six, where we are gonna be today. If you did not bring your Bibles because you were too lazy, then this sermon is especially for you and we're gonna put it on the screen. And I say that, I'm preaching from an iPad. So I'm right there with you, all right? We are wrapping up this series on uh, the Proverbs, looking at the wisdom, the wisest man to ever live, King Solomon, and what he had to say for what it means to be a wise person. And today we turn to one of the seven deadly sins, and that is the sin of sloth. And so when we say sloth, we mean a whole lot of different things. Uh, The Proverbs, as we'll see, also refers to that as a sluggard, but this is the type of person uh, with no motivation. Okay, you could probably think of this person, typecast this person in your mind, the kind of person that sits on the couch and lets life pass them by. They don't get a job. They don't do anything with their life. They would much rather just sit back and let life happen. And that's what the Proverbs warns against. Now, here's what I know if you can hear my voice. Here's what I know. We live in the Woodlands, Texas. Okay, you are some of the least sluggardly people on the planet. Like just per capita, that's true. Okay, I know how hard you work and I know for the vast majority of you, I have to preach more about you taking a break and taking a rest and sleeping than I do about working harder. Okay, I know that to be true, but here's what I'm gonna promise you. That even if you are tempted to start writing your grocery list and your to-do list for the week because you're that productive of a person and you're not a sloth, even if you are tempted to do that, I want you to stick with me because by the end of this message, I'm gonna convict you too. Sound good? All right, Proverbs chapter six, for you lazy fools, it'll be on the screen. Here we go, verse six. Again, I'm reading from an iPad. Don't send me an email. Okay, verse six. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. I had a bit that I had to cut out about how interesting it is that the ant is a woman, but uh, for Luann's sake, because she would be mad if I skipped through this, know that the ant, the, the, the prime example here for Solomon of a hard worker is a woman. And all God's daughters said, amen. amen. Verse seven, without having any chief or officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers food in harvest. 
So King Solomon speaks directly to a slugger, to a sloth, and he says, hey, hey, listen up, buddy. I got some real good advice for you. Go look at an ant. When I read that, I'm like, that's a little bit weird because here's what I know is that I've counseled a lot of young men especially young men who come into my office and and they're searching for meaning. They're searching for purpose. They're searching for something to do. They want to be motivated in their life and they can't find a reason to be motivated. And so they come to me and they seek counsel. I tell you, not once have I said, hey buddy, grab a magnifying glass and go find some fire ants and stare at them. Right? Instead, I think it's great to have a role model. And so I've told them, uh, you know, find somebody in our church that that has worked hard and, and learned what makes them tick. Sit down with somebody older and wiser than you and ask what advice they have for you. Read the book, A Biography of a President. Right? If you want to get into physical shape, go stare at a guy with big biceps and six-pack abs and then figure out how he lives your life and model it off of that. I have never said, go look at an ant. At the same time, spoiler alert, I am not the wisest person to ever live, and Solomon is. So why does Solomon say, go look at the ant? Well, for me, um, our our oldest daughter, Grayson, will be five next month. And so she's in that stage of life where she loves animal facts, okay? Watches all the cartoons uh, uh, about animals. And we played 20 questions, animal games in the car, love animals. So I thought I would share some animal facts because I thought this was weird. Why are we supposed to look at an ant? Well, you may or may not know, but, but ants can lift up to 10 to 50, that's five zero times their own body mass, Okay, uh, there's, a, there's a particular ant called the Asian weaver ant, and I know you already know this, but the Asian weaver ant can lift up to 100 times its own mass. Okay, so to put that into context, uh, take your weight, I'm not gonna ask you for it, but then add two zeros at the end and think about curling that. That's a lot of weight. And we also know this, that ants are the only organisms in the animal kingdom that we know of that farm other animals, Okay, it's a little savage. I read into this process, but there's this particular organism that they like. And so the ant will protect this organism from outside forces and predators in order that they can eat it themselves. Okay, so the ant, in compared to all the rest of, uh, of the animal kingdom, is really special, is really cool. But if you notice, that's not why Solomon praises the ant. Instead, Solomon says, hey, if you're a slugger, if you're a sloth, look at the ant and then see the one quality that Solomon brings out. The ant is a self-starter. The ant doesn't need a chief. The ant doesn't need a ruler. The ant does not need a boss breathing over its shoulder telling it what to do. Instead, the ant is motivated by the fact that good times aren't going to be forever and the ant knows that. The ant knows that the harvest may be plentiful now, but later on down the road, there might be famine. So it's internally motivated to do the work that God has created it to do. And, excuse me, here's what we know to be true, is that that quality of being a self-starter is still so valuable today. This is one of the reasons that we can see back in the Proverbs and see ancient wisdom that speaks truth into our day today. Because here's the deal, I've written some job descriptions in my day. I've read plenty of job descriptions in my day. Not once have I ever written or seen a job description that said this, the ideal candidate will arrive promptly when work begins and sit at their desk. They will twiddle their thumbs until the first moment comes along that their boss has a task for them to do. The ideal candidate will listen to exactly what they are supposed to do and exactly how to do it and do no more and no less than what they are told to do. Never seen it before. What does every single job description say? We're looking for a self-starter. We want somebody who's gonna identify problems that we've never seen before and then act on them before they are asked to do. This is a quality that we all want to have. And yet for a lot of us, it's hard and we feel like there's seasons of our life where we're a sluggard, where we're a sloth. Maybe we want to be like that. We want to be a self-starter, but we aren't. And why is that? Oh, well, let me tell you, if, you've, if you're in a season of sloth or you know somebody in your family who, who that kind of fits the bill, let me say this, it's not a conscious decision that they make every day, right? It's not like one day they decide that they're just gonna stop doing anything productive and they're gonna sit on the couch all day. Instead, what the Proverbs will say is it's a soul level issue. This is not just a here and there, them deciding to not do what they can do. Instead, it's a soul level issue. Here's what happens uh, later on in Proverbs 13, 4. Solomon says, the soul of the sluggard 
craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. So Solomon's saying, look, hey, hey, the, 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 the motivated person, the ant, she is reaping what she is sowing. She is working hard and receiving the benefits of that. On the flip side, the sloth doesn't want anything. The sloth at its soul gets exactly what it puts out, which is nothing. And so this begs the question then, if it is a soul level issue, then if you're in a season of sloth or if you know somebody who it is, how can we push forward? What's the difference between a sloth and an ant? If I had to put it into one word, it would be this motivation. Motivation. What is your motivation? Because here's what we know to be true is that you can have all the ability in the world. You can have all the passion in the world. You can have all the opportunities and all the resources in the world, but if you lack motivation, you, in the words of the Proverbs, will crave and receive nothing. See, I can look back very easily at times in my life where I've been most slothful, have been the seasons where I am least motivated. So for me, very quick, this was an easy illustration to think of. Uh, it was my senior year of high school. Okay, so senior year of high school in September at the start of the school year, I got my acceptance email to Texas A&M. That was weak, y'all. You can do better than that. <laughs> so I, I get accepted to my dream school. I've told you before, I was brainwashed from the moment I came out of the womb. This is the school that you will go to. And so all up until that point, I had been working to get into A&M. In September of my senior year, I get in. Now, let me say this. Um, I, I, I speak with a lot of students now, um, and getting into a and now is actually really difficult. I'm aware of that. Back in my day, like I colored 95% in the lines, and they let me in. It was a lot easier back then than it is now. But I get my acceptance email from a and my dream school, the only school I applied to. I'm great. And virtually overnight, I was stricken with a condition. And what is that condition? Senioritis. Some of you just had some seniors get out of your house and you know what this is all about, right? I had senioritis. What does that mean? All my motivation was gone. I still had all the ability. I still had all the opportunity. I just didn't care no more. Okay, so I went from like, you know, junior, early junior year, I'm really fighting for my class rank and I'm reading all the books that I get from my AP English teacher. And then like second semester, the cliff notes are good enough, right? Senior year, like I'm skimming the Wikipedia page about the book, okay? I am checked out. I, I did enough to get by, but no more. Again, all the ability was still there. All the opportunities was still there. All I was missing was that internal motivation. See, here's what can happen with motivation is that if you're a goal-oriented person and, and I consider myself in that boat, what can easily happen is once we reach a particular goal, we check out. Here's what I mean by that. I believe in, in setting goals every year. I do that every year. At the start of every year, I pray over the year. I determine a word that's gonna be my direction for the year. And then I make a bunch of goals. And here's what the goals are often like. They're good goals and I write them down and I encourage you to write down your goals too. I write them down. I'm gonna read 20 books this year. I'm gonna get this amount of uh, number of weight on my bench press, I'm gonna save up for a new car. Okay, just examples there. But, but here's what can happen. Those are great goals. You should have goals like that. But what can so easily happen is that after I read the 20th book, I'm not motivated to read the 21st. After I buy that car, I, I'm not motivated to save anymore. I've met the goal. After I've got to that level at the bench press, then why keep training? See, those goals are great, but, but here's what I, I want you to have to keep that motivation going. I don't want you to just have those types of goals. I want you to have what, what I call a meta goal. Okay, this could look like many different things for you, but it's a motivation that each and every morning it is what is causing you to get out of bed. If for you, the action step of this sermon from this week is that you need to go spend some time in prayer and reflection and develop a personal mission statement, I've preached about that before. I say mine to myself each and every morning as my motivating force. I encourage you to do that. But maybe you ask, well, what kind of motivation could this be? I wanna give you three examples of what could be kind of a meta motivation going forward for you. The first is that you could, and quite frankly, you should be motivated to build the kingdom of God. There is always work to be done. 
There is always somebody who needs to know about the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. There is always somebody who is hungry. There is always somebody who is sick. There is always a way for you to build the kingdom of God here. And here's what I know is that a lot of people, especially young Christians, I love being around people who've just encountered Jesus Christ because when they encounter Jesus Christ for the first time, they think and they believe and they know that they can change the world for him. They know that because Jesus has forgiven them that they have to tell everybody that Jesus has forgiven them too. And I love that. We saw that on display here last week. If you missed it, um, we had this place maxed out with students, uh, the next generation and the now generation of leaders for the Christian faith. So incredible. And when I look in their eyes, I see so much hope, so much power, so many dreams. But, but here's what I know to happen is that at some point, we all probably had those dreams. We had that motivation. And then there's something about the world, there's something about time that just grates on us, that rubs us against us, and this friction makes us dull. When the work still needs to be done. That's why Jesus will say in Matthew chapter nine, you know the verse, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. In other words, as long as Jesus has not come back and he still hasn't come back yet, there is work to be done in the kingdom of God. Let that be the motivating factor of your life. Because here's what happens is the moment you accept Jesus, the, the Bible will say that you die to yourself. You pick up your cross and you follow him, which means that your life is no longer about you. It's about the kingdom of God. Maybe another way to think about this is the second motivation. Maybe you could be motivated to help somebody else. Maybe the driving force in your life is to live your life to help somebody else. That could be your family. Some of those motivated, well-rounded men I know, their motivating factor is to give a life to their kids that was better than the one that they had. That's a great factor. I know a lot of people who have a particular group of people that are underprivileged or that they have a really heart and passion for. And everything they do is moving that direction. I think particularly of Loft here. Uh, for us, that's, that's our foster kids. Kids that are in a system, not because of any fault of their own. And because a few people said, I have a passion, I have a motivation. We are changing lives left and right. I love that. Maybe your motivation could not be of yourself, but to be for somebody else. Because again, the Christian life is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. It's not just about you. And if you live that way, you're gonna be disappointed. Now, the last motivator is gonna seem completely contradictory to everything I just said. Here it is. Maybe your motivation could be to become the best version of yourself. Okay, let me explain what I mean by that. I just told you that the Christian life is not about you and it's not. It's not, it's about God, it's about others, and then you come third. That's why I listed this third. But here's what I also know, is it's not about you, but all throughout the scriptures, we see this concept that, that we call in the fancy theology world, sanctification. And all sanctification means is that day by day, we are called to grow in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ. We are called to look more like him than we do the rest of the world. We are called to put to death the sins in our life that seem to pop up each and every day becoming the best version of yourself. And here's what I know is that the better you get spiritually, the better you get mentally, the better you get physically, what's happening is that as you get better, everyone around you gets better too. Becoming the best version of yourself benefits your family. You can be a better mother, you can be a better father, you can be a better son, a better daughter, a better friend. It's gonna affect people in your organization, in your company. Where if you are whole and you are healthy, that's going to spill out to other people. And let's be honest, if each and every week this place we called Loft was filled with people who were the best versions of themselves, living for Jesus, sacrificing for the kingdom, then we become a force like no other. What would it look like for you to be motivated by becoming the best version of yourself? Now again, we're in the Woodlands, Texas, okay? Some of you needed all that. Some of you are struggling with motivation. I've had a lot of people come up to me to say, say that was for me and maybe that was for you. But I suspect a lot of you, I, I see entrepreneurs in the room. I see CEOs in the room. I, I know that you have worked very, very hard. So, so you're still saying, well, what about me? Well, strap in, here we go. Because Solomon is not done. Here's what verse nine says of chapter six. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? 
And when will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Okay, so here's a principle that you've seen throughout this series in Proverbs, and it is really true of the entire Bible. That sometimes the Bible is very straightforward, very clear about what God wants for us. It's pretty black and white. And sometimes it's a general principle that we have to learn. Okay, so when the first time I read this passage in preparing for this message, I thought it was the former, not the latter. I thought like, yo, Solomon, chill out. Because if you just read black and white here, what's he saying? He's speaking directly to me. Hey, Daniel, you know that uh, Sunday afternoon golf nap that you take? And I'm like, yeah, they put golf on on Sunday afternoons for the purpose of napping. (laughs) And Solomon's like, "Uh, yeah, buddy, you keep doing that. Guess what? Poverty. Like destitution. Like your family is done, right? If you take that nap, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little of the folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber. Like, chill out, man. It's just a golf nap, right? But I don't think that's what he's saying here. I think instead what Solomon is trying to show to us is that you might not be a sluggard in your work, but that doesn't mean that you're not a sluggard. You might be extremely hardworking in some areas of your life, but that does not exclude you from the category of being a sloth. What he's trying to say is that if you give the devil just a little bit of a foothold, he's gonna take the whole thing. If you give sloth just a little bit, it might take your whole life. Another way to say it is this, sloth in any area of your life can breed sloth in every area of your life. Sloth in any area, if you begin to slacken some, then it's gonna spill over to the rest of you. I know this is true for me in my own body. If I'm in the gym, if I'm eating healthy, if I'm taking care of my mind, then that spills over to everything else. And on the flip side, if I let sloth creep into one area, it spills over into another. So you may be a hard worker at work, but maybe you're not. Maybe you look at the season of your life and, and, and you're growing complacent. And so here's a question I want each and every one of you to ask this week as you go about your week. Really evaluate this question. Where in my life, in what area of my life have I grown complacent? And said it's just good enough. It's not great, it's not the best it's always been, but but it's good enough. In what area of my life have I grown complacent? Maybe for you, that is your work. Okay, I, I know many of us love our jobs and are fortunate to love what we do, but I know many of you don't. You, you show up late, you, you leave early, you work for Friday. You hate what you do, but you gotta do it for the paycheck and you especially hate your boss because he's a jerk. But you keep going, you keep going, you keep going. You're not putting in any extra effort because you don't want to. Listen, I've preached on this before, but this goes for your work and this goes for any other situation you're facing in your life. If you're facing a problem, you can change one of two things. You can either change your circumstance or you can change your perspective. So maybe for you, you need to change your circumstance. Maybe this is God calling you to to give you a little pep talk to say, hey, hey, get up off and, and apply for a new job. Finally start that business. But I suspect for most of us, it's a change in perspective. What would it look like to to be motivated because your work is a gift? Because there are millions of people on this planet who would kill for your job. What if you began to realize that maybe God was calling you to this job, to this workplace that you don't particularly like because he has somebody there that you need to tell about Jesus Christ? And what if you being there could change someone's destiny? What if he's trying to teach you to search for God in the mundane? In the spreadsheets and the emails and the TPS reports, finding God in the minutia, maybe God has you in this season of your work for a reason. Be motivated by learning what that reason is. But I would suspect for some of us, maybe that complacent area isn't your work, but it's your marriage. So man, I'm gonna speak to you, especially here, husbands, um, but wives, this applies to you as well. But, but, but husbands, in your role in the household, here's what you need to know. That simply because your wife said, I do, does not mean that you have the excuse to stop pursuing her. Just because she said that she loves you and she does, does not mean that you have an excuse to not show her how much you love her. Okay, but you say, but I work so hard. I provide so much for my family. Of course, my wife, of course, my kids know that I love them. They might not. 
Tell your wife that. Show her that. Date her. Pursue her. Don't just tell her that you love her, but tell her why you love her. Because your home is your most important mission field. And if you neglect it because you're working so hard at work, that'll be the biggest regret that you ever have, I promise. Ah, but maybe you've grown complacent in your faith. Maybe you come to church when you can. You like it here, but you got stuff going on. You have vacations and you're tired. You got a lake day. You know, it's too hot. It's too cold. It's raining. It's not raining everywhere in between. And so you come to church as much as you can. You, you, you pray before meals when you, when you remember or, you know, when grandma's in town because you have to. Or, um, you know, you, you read your verse of the day if it pops up on your notifications. But other than that, you, you've kind of just sent it in. I've got my ticket punched to heaven. I'm good to go. Here's what we know to be true, especially looking at the ant. The ant knows that there's gonna be one day that things are not as good as they are now. The harvest may be plentiful now, but later on down the road, it might be famine. So what does the ant do? The ant prepares. And here's what I wanna challenge you to do is, is start building those muscles of your faith now. Start getting in the word. Start praying, get in a small group. We're gonna have a big push here coming in a couple weeks. Start serving. Develop your faith now, because here's some bad news. Difficult times are coming. Job loss, sorrow, bad diagnosis, death, all those things are coming. And if you're not motivated in the here and the now when things might be good to grow in your faith, to not be complacent in it, then you may get to those times and God may feel distant when he wasn't distant all along. You've drifted away. Don't grow complacent in your faith. So I wanna pause here because um, I, I struggled this week to, to compose this message because really think every, everything I've said from here on out or from here before this, um, let's be honest, like a C plus TED talk, okay? With like a little bit of Jesus sprinkled in, Right? I just told you to get motivated to be the best version of yourself to help other people and, and, and to love your wife, right? So I, I began really wrestling with this question, God, why do you care about sloth? If it's one of the seven deadly sins, why is it so important? Why is it up there with like murder and lust, right? This seems a little bit strange. On top of that, why does God care if we sit on our couch and take a nap watching golf? Like, doesn't God have bigger fish to fry? Like, I don't know, famine and war and hunger, and sin, right? Why does God care about sloth? And we'll close with this. I think it's, it's pretty simple. See, God cares about sloth because he cares about this world that he has lovingly created. And here's what we know is that from the throne room of heaven, God looks down and, and he can see everything that we can. And God looks down and he sees the people who are hurting he sees the people who are hungry. He sees the nonprofits that need to be started. He sees the businesses that need to be founded. He sees the inventions that will change human history. And at the same time, in that same instant, God sees all those problems and all those potentials, and then God sees his solution. What's the solution? It's us. It's us. So certainly it breaks the heart of God when he sees the problem and he sees the solution that he's created and, and we waste that. But on top of that, I think God's disdain of sloth, of being a sluggard, is at its core rooted in how much he loves you. See, here's what we know is that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you were created in the image of God. That he knit you together in your mother's womb. And then he breathed into you life and he's been with you all along. And we know that 2,000 years ago, he sent his one and only son. It was God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die the death that you and I deserve, and then to be raised again so that our lives could be fulfilling, so that we could have purpose, and so that we could have eternal life if we will turn of our sin and make him the Lord of our lives. In other words, your life came at a cost to God. And it was the very life of Jesus. So why does God not like sloth? Because he sees you wasting your life and that was a life that cost him something. Do not 
wasted. So in conclusion, stop being a sluggard. Stop being lazy. Stop slacking. Do something with your life. Quit procrastinating. Quit making excuses. Quit letting life pass you by. Make a difference. Write the book. Start the business. Start a Bible reading plan. Ask the girl on a date. Go to the gym. Go back to school and chase your dreams. God has you here for a purpose. So do something about it. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that you have created us in your own image. And we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to die, an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And God, now as we prepare to come to your table, our prayer is that we will once again be wiped clean of our sins, that you will help us to lie those things at the foot of the cross that keep us from you. And may these elements be a reminder for us of your deep love for us. We pray that in Christ's holy name. Amen. There is really truly only one person in the history of the world who's been able to get to the end of their life and to the work that they were sent to do and say the words, it is finished. Because when God sent his son Jesus to finish the work, he finished the work of forgiveness and salvation forever. And on the night that he gave himself up for us, he prepared his disciples He took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was done, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. And all that means is that you can't out sin the grace of God. And he said, every time you drink of it, I want you to do it in remembrance of me. Now, if our servers would come forward while we pray. God, we thank you for the cross. Jesus, we thank you that you gave your sinless life in sacrifice for our sins so that we may walk in the freedom of your mercy and your grace and your love and your forgiveness. So Holy Spirit, pour out on us gathered here and on the gifts of the bread and cup so that they may be the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Amen. Amen. If you're new with us or somewhat new with us, I'll give you kind of an introduction on what communion means to us here. Uh, the first thing that's really cool is that uh, Reverend Luann Riley, that was her first time uh, this weekend to consecrate the elements as a pastor now. And so uh, we celebrate that together. Uh, but here's what's gonna happen. The first thing to know about our communion practice is this, is that we practice what's called open table communion, which means that you don't have to be a member of our church. You don't have to be a Methodist. Uh, all we ask is that if your heart is with Christ and you believe in what these elements point to, then you're welcome to come forward and partake. Uh, the ushers will guide you to one of our stations. You will be given a piece of gluten-free bread. All of our bread is gluten-free. You will then dip it in the cup and you will partake. Uh, if you are still a little COVID conscious or worried about germs, I will be standing front and center here with the old communion packets uh, and we would love to serve you in that way. Uh, After you're done receiving communion, I invite you to go back to your seats. We'll sing one more song here at the end, but just spend some time asking those questions. Where am I growing complacent? And where is God calling me to to move deeper into love and joy uh, and life with him? So brothers and sisters in Christ, the table is ready and Jesus is waiting. Come taste and see that the Lord is good.